Hi everybody! Uh, today I'd like to talk about the language family that Chinese belongs to and, and this is another part. You know what? Um, why don't I turn the lights on as, as, as my uh, 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 grandpa used to say, shed a little light on the subject. I'll be right back. There, maybe that's better. Okay, so um, <clears throat> like I was saying, this is another part of my It's All Chinese to Me series. And today we're going to talk about Sino-Tibetan, and that's the language family that Chinese belongs to. Now, this might be a good time to review, by the way, what exactly a language family is, okay? So, for those of you who uh, have a background in linguistics, sorry, bear with us for just a minute. Um, but for those of you who don't, um, now's a good time to... Uh, find out about something really, really cool. So basically, a language family, let's write that down, language family uh, is a group of uh, languages that are joined together by a common ancestor. Okay, and um, so let's take English for example, right? So both British English and American English evolved out of what's called early modern English. Excuse me, I'm moving my computer. There we go. Maybe that's better. Early modern English, both British and American English, originally evolved out of early modern English, which was the language of uh, Shakespeare and Milton. And on a larger scale, let's talk about French, Spanish, Italian, right? All of these developed from regional varieties of the Latin language, which is the reason we call these languages the Romance languages. They were spread and they, they, they arose from the ashes of a Roman civilization and the Roman Empire. All right, so moving even further back, okay, we can uh, link the English, which, which is a, a Germanic language, we can link English to the Romance languages by a very, very ancient hypothetical language that linguists call Proto-Indo-European. Okay, or, or Pi for short, Proto-Indo-European. And uh, while this language was never written down, we can conclude that it must have existed since so many languages across Western Eurasia and the Indian subcontinent share these similar elements. So, for example, let's take a look at a few languages. All right, let's do um, English. Spanish, uh, Russian, Greek, and Sanskrit, okay? Um, and then we'll throw standard Chinese in too. All right, and let's do something really simple, okay? Something really simple. Let's just count to three. Okay, let's just count to three. So, of course, in English, we have one, one, two, three. Ayo. Spanish, uno, dos, tres. Okay. Russian, adin, dva, three. Okay, and in Greek we have ena. Okay, ena dio tria. Sanskrit we have ekam tve treni. Ekam tve treni. While in standard Chinese, we have E, R, and San. Okay? So let's take a look at some of these words. Okay? So the words in English, Spanish, uh, Russian, Greek, and Sanskrit, right, they all sound similar, while those in Chinese don't. So if we can find further similarities in vocabulary and grammar while demonstrating that these similarities are not just borrowings, like um, in English we have sushi or burrito, right? Of course these aren't actually English words, but they're borrowed. 
Uh, and if these are not borrowings, we can conclude that the first five languages, one, two, three, four, five, yep, the first five languages belong to the same Indo-European family. That is to say, they are all the daughters of the same grandma language, right? They're, they're all the daughters of the same long ago language, while Chinese is probably not. But on the other hand, <clears throat> let's compare Chinese, okay, with uh, Old Tibetan and Old Burmese. Let's compare, let's compare uh, uh, the numbers counting to three in Chinese, Tibetan, and Burmese, and they have an uncanny similarity, especially in the ancient forms of these languages. Okay, so Old Chinese. Okay, Old Tibetan, and Old Burmese. Okay. Okay. Old Chinese, we have two words, all right? One of them is oh, sorry. There we go, maybe you can see. Is eat eat okay for one. Now the second word is, and this this one has a little more cognate, is chuk. Sorry, that should be an E, not a schwa. Tuk, which means single or alone, okay? So, old Chinese, I do. Sorry, I dropped my uh, pen cap, oh well. And we also have... And zoom. Okay, and in Tibetan, Okay, Old Burmese, Ak, Tak, okay, Hak, okay, so. and we're going to put a big old asterisk about this whole thing because these are all reconstructions, they're not actually words that were written down. Uh, uh, phonetically. So in Old Chinese we have yit, yit, or tyuk, nis, sum. Old Tibetan, grik, knis, zum. Old Burmese, ak, or tak, hak, zum. Okay? So you can see that there's this there's this uncanny similarity, and if if there are other uh, grammatical and lexical similarities between these languages, which which there are, and the regular the the, the regularity of these similarities it makes it unlikely that there are simple borrowings. So that said, we can conclude that Chinese, Tibetan, and Burmese belong to the same language family, what linguists would call Sino-Tibetan, okay? And uh, the Sino-Tibetan language family has members spread all across uh, East and Southeast Asia on both sides of the Himalayas, across China, across Tibet, down into Burma, even in uh, parts of India and Thailand, there are Sino-Tibetan languages spoken. And the ancestor language, okay, was probably spoken by a small community somewhere in the densely forested eastern foothills of the Himalayas. Okay, and that would so we're talking about uh, um, you know southwest China, kind of near where I am now, maybe uh, uh, northeast India, that kind of area, and it would have been spoken sometime during the early or the middle Neolithic. All right. And this ancestor language is called Proto Sino Tibetan. 
although of course we don't really know what they called themselves. Um, yeah, and and gradually the descendants of these Proto-Sino-Tibetan speakers and their children's children and their children's children's children migrated and spread over a wider and wider area. So regional dialects uh, became distinct languages as, as one group lost contact with another group and then maybe mixed in with another group and as, as people spread apart from each other they lost contact, maybe met and, and assimilated into non-Sino-Tibetan communities, things like that. Okay, so um, thousands and thousands of years later we have this beautiful like quilt that's been sewn together over the Himalayas with the thread maybe uh, of shared linguistic and cultural origin. So uh, when we examine these these strands of language, they're really it's really cool. There are these barely audible echoes of the distant past, and it, it, we we can we can start to bring back to life the the long gone world of these proto sino tibetans and this is what i really love about historical linguistics and and it, we can get these tantalizing glimpses of this world that they lived in so long ago and incredibly i, I mean comparative linguistics is just magic because because uh, or, or it seems like magic anyway because uh we we can we can uh actually hear the voices of these people come back to us and after thousands and thousands of years of silence we can actually use the comparative method to reconstruct the very words that they must have uttered or may have uttered oh they, they probably uttered something in this ballpark so anyway uh that's that's the proto sino-tibetan language that's the sino-tibetan family and stay tuned because in the next video, we're going to take a trip back in time and we're going to visit the Proto-Sino-Tibetan speakers. Okay, and who were they? Who were they? What was life like for them? You know, did they play beer pong? Um, find out next time. All right, bye everybody.